Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, growing concern about a second wave. It's going to get worse. The challenge here is to prevent it from getting really worse. COVID cases keep climbing and fall hasn't even really begun. Could Canada see more lockdowns? The U.S. campaign kicks into high gear with a low blow. Biden's a stupid person. You know that. You're not going to write it, but you know that. And the race for a COVID vaccine turns political. The endangered whale who carried her dead calf for days has a new baby. I actually punched my coworker in the shoulder. It's, it's like, calf. Ah! The hopes and fears for the baby orca. <laughs> Moving the classroom to the great outdoors. It's always made sense to have kids outside doing this kind of thing, and now it, ha it makes double the sense. Why the future of school could look a lot like this, even in winter. This is The National. Well, summer is winding down, school is ramping up, and Canadians face a crossroads over COVID-19. Tonight, Canada's top doctor is warning infections are on a slow but steady rise raising fears a second wave could be closing in. Dr. Teresa Tam said Canada reported a daily average of 545 new cases over the past week. That's a 25% jump over the week before, which was up 10% from the week before that. The cause for concern is clear. Take Quebec, today reporting 260 new cases, the highest count in over three months. Health officials and political leaders are united in their message. Canadians must stay vigilant to keep the pandemic in check. As Ellen Morrow explains, we could be nearing a tipping point. A busy long weekend brunch in Montreal. Little appetite for fear, even as COVID cases rise. Large indoor gatherings are fueling the increase, say experts. Young people flouting the rules. I'm getting more disappointed and pessimistic by the day as I see that more and more people are unwilling to do what's required. And doing what's required, physical distancing and mask wearing has seldom been more important with cases creeping up. Back to school, colder weather pushing people inside and pandemic fatigue, a troubling trifecta as summer fades. It's still a fairly low number, but it is indicative that something's happening in the community. And if we don't do anything right now, it could get to the point of a much uh, higher rate of spread. 81 cases have been linked to a karaoke night at this Quebec City bar. While police in Sherbrooke, Quebec, cracked down on two crowded bars there this weekend where patrons were not physically distancing. In Ontario, there have been at least 100 new cases every day for almost two weeks. British Columbia is on a precipice, warn authorities there, as case numbers grow. It's too soon to call it a second wave, says Raywat Dianandan, but it's a crucial moment. It's going to get worse. You know, um, the, the challenge here is to prevent it from getting really worse. This is in the hands of Canadians everywhere. If cases continue to rise, doctors say Canadians should expect some targeted lockdowns in the months ahead. Now we're kind of dancing with it. We might have to do a bit of a curtsy or spin move to bring things back down. You struggled for every breath. Aaron Culver was hospitalized with COVID in March. The 38-year-old still experiencing symptoms has this plea. People need to be more cautious than they are being. I think that there's some behavior that definitely is not going to benefit um, us as a country, us as a province, um, in terms of keeping the numbers lower. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, now infectious diseases specialist Dr. Isaac Bogosh has had a very keen eye on all of these developments. And Dr. Bogosh, how big potentially is the ripple effect here? Yeah, unfortunately, it can be rather large. We know that many people infected are in their 20s, but of course, this is a very contagious infection. And we've seen other places in the world have a similar trend, but of course, it doesn't stay in that 20 year old demographic for long. And it's only a matter of time before we see this infection brought home to parents or grandparents or other cohorts or other members of the community that might just not have the same uh, course of illness and may have a more severe course of illness with COVID-19, in which case we start to see 
a growing number of hospitalizations and sadly a growing number of deaths in communities uh, affected with COVID-19. But and, and it seems to me that the timing all, of all of this is, is particularly precarious, not just because of schools reopening, but uh, colder weather, uh, flu season. Are, are you concerned about how much worse this could get? Yeah, I, I certainly am. And many of us who are following this closely uh, are, are concerned because there's a lot of different factors that are driving people indoors right now. Schools, people are going back to work in person, economies are wide open, and of course it's colder outside, driving, driving people indoors. So certainly these are, these are situations where we know the virus can be transmitted easily if we don't take the appropriate public health precautions. Okay, Dr. Bogosho, it's good to talk to you. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Quebec is dealing with an outbreak at a private senior's home in St. Jerome. That is 45 minutes north of Montreal. The first case was reported there two weeks ago. Now there are up to 24 people infected, 19 residents and five employees. Three of the residents who tested positive are now in hospital. Now those coronavirus hotspots put a big question mark on the next few days. Canada faces a school year like no other and the tension can be felt in all corners of the country. David Thurton has this snapshot as parents and students weigh their options and as officials offer few guarantees. Alexandra Mandewo is ready for a new school year, but not ready for mandatory in-person classes at her high school outside of Vancouver. In my household, I have someone who's immunocompromised and the idea of going to school and then maybe bringing COVID back home is just something that I'm not that comfortable with. Back to school jitters are common, but during a pandemic, there's a lot more at stake. Infections have surfaced in classrooms already reopened. Five Ottawa schools now have confirmed cases. And students at a Calgary high school are self-isolating after a positive case. Classes resumed just last week. Alberta's opposition wants more safety measures. Definitely capping class sizes and having the room to physically distance would uh, cause um, a greater degree of confidence and certainty that we're going, that we're doing everything we can to slow the spread. Some are wary about sending their kids back, but willing for now, like this infectious disease researcher. So we recognize that really sending the kids to school, at least at this point with the numbers we have, is, is about the same risk as taking them shopping or, or taking them out into the community for other activities. But some students wonder, why take the risk? Usually in life, there are many options that you can, different pathways you can take. But the fact that we're all being forced to go to school in a time where things like that aren't normal, we're in unprecedented times, you would think that there would be other options that we could choose from. For many this year, the path back to school is filled with tough choices. David Thornton, CBC News, Ottawa. While most kids are heading back to school, many of their parents will still be working in their home offices. That's not only impacted how they live, but in some cases where they live. Jacqueline Hansen explains. This isn't the home this couple planned to buy just six months ago. We were hunting a two bedroom condo in core downtown, so we could just walk to our office every day. Then the pandemic hit and they both started working remotely. My meeting, she could hear, she could get disturbed, and like, and vice versa. Their employers say they'll keep working from home most of the time, even after the pandemic. So instead of a condo for the same price, they bought a four bedroom house outside of Toronto. There is enough space. We could just get up one day and decide to work from any part of the house. Data from Realosophy shows sales of houses in the greater Toronto area in August jumped more than 50% from the same time last year. Some of that is pent up demand, but it's still far higher than the pickup in sales of condos. A lot of people are looking for more space and practically all of my clients are uh, nowadays working from home. And according to ADP Canada, 45% of Canadians it surveyed would keep it that way at least three days a week. It seems remote work is here to stay, or at least the majority of us want it to be. There's a willingness to have a discussion about a fundamental change in the way we work, and it calls into question everything that we've been doing for the last 30 years. This commercial real estate broker expects demand for total office space to drop by 25% or more. I would venture to say that every company, every organization in the world is suddenly reevaluating their need for space. And forcing others into a difficult new reality. 
if we don't have the core, you know, this office tower full and people coming down for lunch, then, you know, that, that's everything for us. Sales at this Toronto restaurant are down 70%. When the patio closes for the winter and if workers don't come back downtown. We can't pay rent. We can't afford to pay rent. It feels scary, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm very worried. Worried a shift away from the city centre could also wipe out livelihoods well. of those left behind. <laughs> Sorry. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Now, COVID-19 is also a key election issue in the United States, still leading the world in caseload. But Donald Trump didn't talk much about that today, as Paul Hunter tells us, instead playing up the economy and putting down his competition. As an opening salvo to begin the home stretch in the race for the White House, today the President of the United States labeled his opponent a clueless incompetent who is stupid. Biden's a stupid person. You know that. You're not going to write it, but you know that. Such stuff isn't out of character for Donald Trump. Neither is the president's context-free view of why Americans should vote for him, describing U.S. job numbers this way. We've added a record-setting 10.6 million jobs since May. What Trump did not say is that there's another 10 million more who've lost jobs due to the pandemic and, say critics, Trump's handling of it, who have not found work. Say many, get set for a campaign where the whole truth is a moving target. And with Labor Day putting all four main candidates out in the spotlight at the same time today, the focus was again on Trump. Still under fire for a report last week that on a trip to Europe two years ago, he disparaged American soldiers killed in action, calling them losers and suckers. Well, that's when they Trump today Russia. again denied it. Uh, it's a disgrace. Who would say a thing like that? Only an animal would say a thing like that. Meanwhile, Joe Biden continued his low-key, physically distanced campaign, weighing in on Trump's suggestion that there may be a COVID vaccine available before the November vote. But, said Biden, He said so many things that aren't true. I'm worried if we do have a really good vaccine, people are going to be reluctant to take it. That said, Biden added he'd take the vaccine, even if it came out early, potentially helping Trump. Biden said he'd take it tomorrow, even if it costs him the election. The country needs it, he said. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. In California, thousands of people spent this holiday fleeing from fire as officials expanded evacuation orders. Wildfires burn up and down the state. More than 800,000 hectares are destroyed. That is a new record with four months still left in the year. Another record breaker, the temperature. 49 degrees yesterday in L.A. County, part of an extreme heat wave. And as Aaron Collins tells us, the dryness is making it all the more dangerous. Across California, two dozen wildfires have residents on edge and on the move. These people trapped near the Sierra National Forest east of San Jose, told by a forest ranger to drive through the flames to get to safety. Holy Just keep going. And it was actually per her instruction that we drove through that fire. She said it was the only way down and it hadn't yet crossed the, uh, the road and that we just had to drive through it. I think if we had stayed just 10 minutes more, we might not have been so lucky. This is the view from the ground during the worst wildfire season in California's history. One fire started over the weekend in San Bernardino County was caused by a pyrotechnics machine at a gender reveal party. Another fire for the 14,000 firefighters on the ground to contain during a record heat wave. Whenever you have conditions that are in the three digits and they're across so many different areas within our jurisdiction within an LA County fire, you know, you're always going to be on edge a little bit. But this is something that we prepare for. This is something that we train for. This is something that we're ready for, and we'll handle that. As California burns, extreme fire warnings are also in place in Oregon, Colorado, and Washington. And this Canadian wildfire expert says climate change means longer, more intense wildfire seasons are here to stay. This is a new reality, and we're on a downward spiral. And we're going to continue to see more and more fire in areas across the globe. 
Last year was Australia, right now it's California. Three of the four largest fires in California's history are burning right now. And with more hot, windy weather forecast for this week, California's worst fire season ever could get even nastier. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. A court in Saudi Arabia has jailed eight people for the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. State media reported the defendants were given sentences between 7 and 20 years in prison. But the trial was criticized by human rights groups, saying the real masterminds remained free. Khashoggi was killed in 2018 at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. His remains never found. A big crackdown in Belarus over the weekend. Officials announced today that more than 600 protesters were arrested during the fourth straight weekend of demonstrations against last month's election, which many believe was rigged. And now there are reports. A leading opposition figure was abducted today in Minsk. Witnesses say Maria Kolesnikova was bundled into a minibus by masked men and driven away. According to a Russian news agency, police there have denied any involvement. There is much better news today for a Russian opposition leader weeks after his brush with death by poisoning. Alexei Navalny is successfully coming out of a medically induced coma. Tonight, Chris Brown gets some deeper insight into how his poisoning may have occurred. The news out of the Berlin hospital treating Alexei Navalny sounds hopeful. He's out of a coma, responding to verbal cues and slowly breathing on his own again. But even as his supporters breathed easier, they equally attacked the Kremlin for ignoring his attempted assassination. In a video message, ally Lubov Sobol said Navalny fell into a coma in Russia. He's a citizen of Russia and they should investigate in Russia who poisoned him. Navalny nearly died on a flight over Siberia on August the 20th as he screamed in agony. Yet on the ground, Russian doctors said they found no toxin in his system. It was only when he got to Germany that doctors there confirmed traces of the Cold War era nerve agent Novichok. It's the same poison that was used to try to kill Sergei and Yulia Skripal in the UK in 2018. Vil Mirzayanov helped develop Novichok in Soviet times and later told the world of its existence. He believes whoever poisoned Navalny found a way to put it inside his clothing so that it slowly absorbed into his body. It penetrated to the, into the body of Navalny, but it was not uh, poisons for other people. With the condemnation rising inside and outside the country, Kremlin-friendly voices have been struggling to formulate a response beyond, we didn't do it. We sent Navalny to Germany without poison in his system. It was discovered, strangely, in Germany. So it's Germany that has to explain itself. The next move may come from Germany. Russia exports a tremendous amount of natural gas to Europe, and delaying a pipeline under the Baltic Sea could come at a huge cost. Today, a German official said all options for sanctions are on the table. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Well, scientists have spotted a reason to celebrate off the coast of Washington State. I actually punched my coworker in the shoulder. It's there's like, yeah. A new baby for a killer whale watched around the world. Next on The National, the challenges ahead for mom and calf. And could this be the classroom of the future? Keeping kids safe by learning outdoors. Do you have teachers, principals who are skeptics? Absolutely. I have a taste of winter on the unofficial end of summer. Wow, I was like, dang it, that is too soon. We're back in soon. Welcome back. Kyle Rittenhouse, he is the teenager charged with intentional homicide in the shooting deaths of two Kenosha, Wisconsin protesters. Susan Ormerson tells us Americans seeking to protect gun rights are rallying to help him. There are at least two versions of that ugly night in Kenosha when Joseph Jojo Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber, two demonstrators, were shot to death at close range by a 17-year-old toting an AR-15 rifle, Kyle Rittenhouse. Huber was going after him with a skateboard when he was fatally shot. For some supporters, a valiant attempt to wrestle the gun away, says his friend Seth. 
the main thing he was going for, sure, he tried hitting him with the skateboard. I think he did get contact with him, but he was basically just trying to get that gun out of his hands. That's all he wanted was that gun out of his hands. He didn't want anybody else to get hurt. And we're running medical. We're going in and we're getting control. And but for others, Kyle Rittenhouse has emerged as the latest and lauded case in a highly politicized campaign for gun rights and armed self-defense. The first deadly shooting occurred here at the car source. Kyle Rittenhouse's lawyer says he was retreating from an angry mob who were, quote, relentlessly hunting him down as prey. And the 17-year-old had no choice but to turn in this spot and fire in self-defense. Rosenbaum appeared to be unarmed and had five gunshot wounds, according to an autopsy. This is 100% self-defense, Tucker. Rittenhouse's lawyer, John Pierce, has taken the case public on Fox News. He was uh, in imminent uh, uh, danger of serious bodily harm or death. Powerful gun rights groups are getting behind Kyle. Hashtag fight back. Founded, it says, to counter the lies of the radical left, has raised a reported $700,000. A Christian crowdsourcing site, several hundred thousand more. The lawyer even tweeted a shout out with Rittenhouse in jail. I just want to thank every single one of you from the bottom of my heart for the underlying support. In Antioch, Illinois, where he lived, near the fire station where he was briefly a junior cadet, at the donut shop he went to, mixed views. He is, a, in a sense, a hero because, you know, he stood okay. up for the community. I think it was pretty stupid. What he did was wrong. He should have just left it be, let the Kenosha police and everybody else down there handle it. If the case goes to trial, it will stir tensions long after the barricades are gone. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Kenosha, Wisconsin. A UK judge has rejected a bid to delay an extradition hearing for Julian Assange. He yeah, is psychological torture before there's no end and it's now 11 years. His lawyers wanted more time to respond to new accusations. The WikiLeaks founder is fighting to avoid extradition to the United States where he faces accusations of hacking and espionage. Assange says the charges against him are political. Prince Harry and Meghan have paid back more than $4 million, 2.4 million pounds of British taxpayers' money. It was money used to renovate Frogmore Cottage in Windsor, which will remain Harry and Meghan's residence when the couple visits the UK. They agreed to pay the money back, though, when they stepped down as senior working royals in March. And turning to a family saga off North America's west coast, the famous J-Pod of endangered southern resident killer whales is welcoming a new member two years after a heartbreaking loss. Here's Briar Stewart on how the new baby Orca and her mother are doing. In the waves off Washington State, a rare sighting of a super pod of southern resident killer whales. They were breaching and playing. Among the group, a brand new baby, just a day or two old. I actually punched my coworker in the shoulder and said, there's a calf. Sarah McCullough was the first to lay eyes on the calf, known as J57. While a newborn is always cause for celebration, this birth is special. The mother orca is J35. In 2018, people around the world were moved by her apparent act of mourning. She carried her dead calf for 17 days, 1,600 kilometers, before finally letting go. In July, scientists learned that she was pregnant again. To have her have a calf was just heartwarming, not only for her, but for the entire community that with these animals being so critically endangered, every life matters. Researchers say the whale appears healthy, even precocious. They're cautiously optimistic. There is only a 50% survival rate for the first year. So this, the next 12 months are going to be incredibly important, not just obviously for the survival of the individual calf, but for the population trajectory as a whole. Because the southern residents number just 73. Their primary food is Chinook salmon and those fish are becoming scarce too. There are also concerns around pollution and noise emanating from marine traffic. The orcas typically hunt in the Salish Sea in the summer, but there have been few sightings this year. 
with the absence of our southern residents in these waters for so much of what is historically their native feeding grounds, their fishing grounds, it really says that when the shells are bare, the whales aren't there. They're having to go farther. Which is why a new whale is such a welcome addition for a group that's still struggling to survive. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Next, we explore an idea that could be the future of the classroom. I'm just going to say bring bug spray because it's lava mosquitoes. Could students learn outdoors even in the winter? Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of winter, what a way to mark the unofficial end of summer in Alberta. That's ahead in our moment. We didn't see 2020 coming. The coronavirus and COVID-19 have dramatically changed our world. The way we work, the way we learn, even the way we play. Navigating these present realities, death, distancing, the divisions apparent in who is bearing the brunt of COVID. All of it can show us powerful lessons for the future, new directions for schools, offices, and public health. So. This week, The National is looking at the future and where we could go from here. Tonight, an old school idea, keeping students safe while learning by taking the classroom outside. And sure, the winter weather, the city life some schools are surrounded by all challenge this model of schooling. But for some, it's a better alternative to students wearing masks all day or online only classes. David Common met some of the educators who see opportunity in the outdoors. Letting go these days can be tough. Life in COVID is full of little details and big decisions. The routine of morning drop-off, a test of risk tolerance. And yet at the Guelph Outdoor School, there's seemingly no worry. They're outdoors, so it's not like they're stuck inside a building with a recycled air or anything like that. I think that this is the best option, honestly, right now with what's going on. I'm just going to say bring bug spray because it's lava mosquitoes. Oh, really? Okay, that's good advice. Right, bug spray. Because the classroom here is the forest all day, every day. How do you know it's a choke cherry tree, guy? Because the stem is smooth. There's learning here, but not what you might find in a traditional school setting. That one's sour. So sour. We're actually trying to support kids in making sense of a changing world. Chris Green was a classroom teacher and eight years ago built this alternative. A supplement to regular school with kids coming here instead once or twice a week during the normal school year. In the classroom, kids are, are just brought along on something and they don't have that chance to exercise like their agency and their follow their curiosity. And when we give them an option to do that in this place, it creates great results. I remember the frog. They should be over, over here. Over the summer, it's given kids practice for the school year. They're cohorting 10 maximum together, including the instructors. And amid the evolving guidance on COVID precautions, one thing that's never changed, being outside is generally considered safer. For me, it's always made sense to have kids outside doing this kind of thing. And now it, ha it makes double the sense because it's now shifted from an educational and developmental initiative to a kind of a preventative public health initiative. So to tell the difference, there's a red flower in the middle of Queen Anne's Lace, and that's not uh, on water hemlock. David is 13, and this fall we'll not be back in the classroom. Yeah, that's a little red One of his flower. moms is sure immunocompromised. Right because my partner is so um, fragile, it's not safe for us as a family to have him go back to school. Point two, downtown Guelph. So Cheryl Cadogan has decided David will learn online, but at least once a week continue to come here to spend time with other kids. It's definitely concerning, but at the end of the day, his mental health is also an important part of this. Um, and so it's a balancing act. It's too small to be an eagle, which is number one. Way too small. 
There are plenty of like-minded parents willing to spend the $65 a day all this costs, though there are many options for lower-income families too. Maybe it's part of the way. Enrollment here is way up, and a new partnership with a local Montessori school means there will be a full-time program on offer this fall. What are your phone calls and emails like? I can't even keep up. This year we've added about seven full-time programs on top of our first 10 and it filled in a day. Like the phone is off the hook and I can't even keep track. The idea of moving class outside is hardly new. <laughs> Tuberculosis pushed Toronto, New York and other cities to form open air schools in the early 1900s. Kids were fed hot drinks, taught how to hand wash, even napped outside. A hundred years ago, there was a realization that fresh air can help reduce uh, disease transmission. And I think we need to take a, take a look at that and start considering that again. Um, Dr. Lindsay Marr of Virginia Tech studies how viruses spread through the air. She says those outdoor schools were on to something that could apply now to COVID-19. I think outdoors is going to be much safer than indoors and so any opportunity that there is to move an activity outdoors I would I would definitely jump on that. What is it about being outside that makes things so much lower risk? The main thing about being outside is that there's a lot of dilution so if somebody is infected and they're releasing virus into the air you can think of a smoker being outdoors that rapidly disperses throughout the atmosphere and becomes very dilute whereas if you're indoors that smoke or the virus can be trapped and build up in the air. So the idea is get people out of the inside and into the outside. Absolutely, and take advantage of the space that you have available to you. Of course, most Canadians live in cities and suburbs, and their kids largely go to public schools where there isn't always a forest next door. Um, it's great to see over in the schoolyard some raised bed planters. Yeah. These are quick and easy starts. Um, mm -hmm for schools to get started to support their outdoor learning environment. This schoolyard in Toronto's Kensington Market is full of features like shade and places to sit. But the message from Canada's largest school board in Toronto is that outdoor learning can happen anywhere. Outdoor education principal David Hawker Budlovsky is leading that push. We don't need grandiose outdoor classrooms. It's not about erecting tents and replicating the classroom in an outdoor space. It's actually about thinking differently about the spaces that we have. Do you have teachers, principals who are skeptics? Absolutely. A absolutely. For some people it is going to be just starting with your read aloud underneath a tree. For others it is going to be going into that local green space that may even look like a ravine and talk about shelter buildings, strong and stable structures. So yes there are skeptics, but yes, there are champions, and together we need to work in this new reality that we're living. How much of your year will you spend out here as opposed to in that building? For sure, it'll be a third of the day all year, but if I can do more, I will. At this public school in Caledon, north of Toronto, Janice Haynes is used to teaching classes outdoors, even in winter. These kids are dressed for the weather, and we're out in very cold weather. It's just the time, you know, you have to just monitor the time and make sure these kids have what they need. Students here already see nature as a classroom. Whether it's a lesson in the freezing cold or a project outside in the spring, outdoor learning has taken hold here. But it wasn't an easy sell at first. When we first began the outdoor program, we had the usual kids that that hung around the doors and we really felt uncomfortable. But as time went on, we don't have those door hangers anymore. Pamela Gibson's been teaching outdoors for years and helped create the program here in the early 2000s. How do you connect the curriculum that you've got to follow with being outside? We have to remember curriculum came from here. It, it, it's supposed to be what children need to function in the world, not just inside the building, not just inside their homes, not just at their dance lessons, but out here in the real world, in their community. Well, and they spend a lot of time doing waterways with trucks through there, so yeah. I'm sure. And in this pandemic, Pamela and Janice see opportunity. Change is happening in so many workplaces so fast, 
Why not in schools? This is an opportunity for great change and for catching up on maybe some things we could do better. No doubt those benefiting the most from this are the kids. I like just being outside and just getting out in nature. What if it was like this all the time? That would be, I would, I'd love that. <laughs> so would many parents. Yes, COVID has made this a safer choice for many, but climbing beyond the limits of a classroom means the future of education could look a lot more like this. I just did it! Not a school in a community, but a community that is a school. Okay, guys. Come on back up. David Common, CBC News, Guelph, Ontario. And later this week, a look at what the future of work could look like. Until there's a vaccine, you can expect the pre-pandemic office to be a thing of the past. In some places, no paper, no pens, no mugs, no trays of food. So again, this was a, a space to eat and there was a foosball table like many companies used to have. We don't want people doing those sorts of things. I feel like you're a little bit of a tour guide in, in a corporate museum. In a corporate museum, it's a bit sad. Safe spaces now, more valued than social ones. Keeping office workers healthy and following the rules means the work world might have to get tougher. Well, we have spies. We call them change champions. The new world of work in the days to come on The National. Next, a new learning curve for post-secondary students. I definitely would have preferred to have gone to a lecture in person. We look at the challenges of adjusting to university and college life without being able to set foot on campus. Well, students are heading back to college and universities this month, but many won't be setting foot on campus as they start a new academic year. Tashana Reed tells us how some plan to adjust to remote learning while still connecting with classmates. Casey Aruby is preparing for her first year of university as an industrial design student, except she won't be stepping foot on campus. It's still stressful because it's like university <laughs> and I'm... I'm excited and nervous. It's a whole new experience, so I don't want to miss anything up. Her first year will be at home, learning and creating from afar. One concern, how it will all translate online. I'm just hoping that I still get the same amount of like information that I would in class. Being online means missing out on another post-secondary experience. I definitely would have preferred to have gone to a lecture in person. You know, I would have liked to, to like meet new people, make some friends. Hey, what's up, man? Kyle Archer, a first year film and TV student, is making do at home, connecting with his new classmates using Zoom and group chats. You know, we help each other out when we have questions. For thousands of post-secondary students, online learning will be the default this semester. The University of British Columbia has adapted 3,000 of its courses for remote learning. Some in-person classes will be allowed if virtual isn't practical. We understand this is a different experience for our students. We want this to be over as much as they do. We are doing the very best we can to provide the very best education we can for them. Fourth year UBC student Gabriella Scenario got a taste of university life during the pandemic last semester and found some things were easier. I am more confident in asking questions, um, giving answers because I won't get that awkwardness or self-consciousness of people looking at me. Still, this wasn't what she pictured heading into her final year. There is nothing quite like the excitement of going to class back in September to see the hallways and to see the roads on campus being filled out by students. As for Ruby, she's trying to keep things in perspective. It's better to keep people safe than to um, always have your way. And looks forward to the day she'll be able to attend a lecture on campus in person. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Next on the National Reclaiming a Lost Neighborhood. I wanted to show that the black community was just as much a part of Vancouver as any other community within Vancouver. Celebrating what was once Hogan's Alley right after the break. Vancouver's erasure of a prominent black community is being commemorated by a black artist. He is 
painted a mural on the structure that replaced the neighborhood. It's one of the exhibits by four black artists in this year's Vancouver Mural Festival. So the mural behind me that I'm painting with fellow artists is called Hope Through Ashes, a requiem for Hogan's Alley. The idea behind the mural is very much to bring into more of a spotlight, acknowledge and pay tribute to the area of Strathcona, AKA Black Strathcona, that was Hogan's Alley, but also to pay tribute to some of the people who live there. This is Vi Moore and Robert Moore, and they ran a happening famous chicken and steak, AKA soul food restaurant. There's even photos of people like Sammy Davis Jr. even being at the spot. In 1967, the city of Vancouver ordered the demolishing of the neighborhood so as to create the viaduct. There is a significant somber tone in the mural in that it's being painted on the very instrument that led to the demolishing of Hogan's Alley. I wanted to show that the black community was just as much a part of Vancouver as any other community within Vancouver. It's extremely important to see black art in Vancouver. A lot of people like to focus on the fact that the black population in Vancouver is only 1%, and so it's easy to just discount wanting to include the black community in anything, but especially art. Um, but people need to understand that 1% is still a community that exists. And to be invisible and to have a history of erasure and not have any kind of visibility is problematic. So it's extremely important to amplify black voices, to amplify black art. In taking down Hogan's Alley, Vancouver ultimately took down a part of itself, an internal conflict that hopefully one day we can come back from and rectify by rebuilding a community that benefits everyone. Well, that is a wonderful thing. Beautiful, too. Next on The National, spending the unofficial end of the summer in the snow. Parts of Alberta received a taste of winter. Our moment is next. Oh, well, looks a bit like uh, January or February, doesn't it? But this photo was taken today. Instead of spending the holiday in the heat, many parts of Alberta instead experienced snow. That cruel end to summer is our moment. I was just saying to my husband, oh my God, look at these, there's snow in Tuscany, there's snow. And he said, look out our window and suddenly it, it was snowing here too. Cooler weather was forecast and certainly there was frost warnings and snow forecast for the mountain and foothills area, but not for Calgary. So I was like, dang it, that is too soon. And we weren't quite expecting that. I love snow, I love winter. Anyone would tell you I look forward to the season of winter. However, it's a little too soon. With tomato plants, I was trying to ripen them on the vine and that is not going to happen. I'm going to actually harvest them today and bring them in and, and ripen them in a cardboard box, I guess. <laughs> it's not unusual, it shouldn't shock us as Calgarians, but we still are like, what the, you know, when it happens. Definitely thinking about getting those snow tires on. I tend to always, you know, put them on way too late. And just a reminder, it's coming. <laughs> oh, that's painful. It looks like it's already there. <laughs> um, all the empathy in the world for the people in Calgary. And I know that you have empathy for your neighbors to the south in Denver because I find this striking. Today in Denver, it was Denver, Colorado, it was 91 degrees. So, which is what it, I'm sorry, like, that's like 32 okay. ish wow, yeah. Celsius. By 6 a.m. it will be snowing. Snowing? Yeah, there's a transition. No period. kidding. <laughs> Jeez. Good thing we're not there. Uh, that's The National for this September 7th. Hope you have a great night. Good night.